Are you ready? See you, Brad. It's time for another episode of Fireside Chat. We're back tonight for our post-trade deadline episode as Matt and I join you again to talk Flames hockey. How you doing, Matt? Excellent. Looking forward to having a good conversation this week. Yeah, hopefully we'll uh, we'll have some trade deadline news to talk about because right now it's uh, it's looking pretty barren on that front. Yeah, it's kind of surprising that a week away from the trade deadline and there's absolutely zero news out there outside of the Curtis Glenn Cross thing anyway. Yeah, yeah, it seems odd. Like usually there's rumors and news abound at this point. Yeah, not so much for Flames news, but around the league, usually there's uh, about 15 or 20 rumors flying about various players, but it's basically Curtis Glenn Cross, and that's about it. Yeah. Well, let's, uh, let's jump into what's happened this week, and then we'll get back to talking about the deadline. Can do. So this past... This past week, we had a disappointing week for Flames fans. After the Boston game on Monday, which is when we broadcast, which was right after that on Tuesday, uh, we played two more games, and the Flames walked away with one point on the week. So they got an overtime loss against Minnesota on Wednesday, and they lost to the Ducks here at at home uh, 6-3 on Friday. Did you watch both those games? What are your thoughts, Matt? Oh, I was actually there for both, and... That Anaheim game, I don't know what it is about the Anaheim Ducks, but for the first 35 minutes of that game, Calgary was in complete control of that game. And a weird, strange bounce on the Cogliano goal in the second period, and then whatever that was in the third period. (laughs) It's just bizarre. Like, it... You don't anticipate that many bad bounces going against you in one period. Yeah, no, for sure you don't. And I mean, to me, when I watched the Anaheim game, I thought, okay, we've been on the opposite side of the same luck this season. So I thought it was kind of our time to get the bad bounces against us. Yeah, and it happens. You never like when it happens, and it's always a bit of a piss-off, but... At least they can hope to rebound against the New York Rangers and pick up from where they left off prior to that. I was at the Minnesota game on Wednesday, and, you know, I was I was kind of frustrated by the Flames there, too. I mean, all night, it seemed that they couldn't complete their passes. Every time they were passing, they were passing it right to a white jersey. And, you know, they, they were, I think, lucky to even get the two goals they got in that game. They... they took over in the third period for sure because they'd worn Minnesota down but they didn't play a great game no and I don't know what it is about Minnesota lately but the Flames just can't seem to break through in their usual manner against them you know I think if you look at a lot of the Calgary Minnesota games early in the season I think part of where we're having success was just breaking them down playing playing hard and wearing them out near the end. And I think that Minnesota's on a hot streak, and I think that they're playing a more complete game at this point in the season than they were a lot earlier. So I think we probably were facing a very different challenge than we expected going in. Well, plus they're actually getting NHL-caliber goaltending since they acquired Dubnik, which I don't think they had with any of their other goalies this season. Yeah, well, Dubnik really kept them in that game on Wednesday because even though the Flames weren't playing great, they got a ton of shots in the late second and third. Exactly. And usually with teams that have a good overall team depth, as long as the goalie can stop most of the easy shots, that then they'll likely come away with two points. And Dubnik, he was up to the task. He didn't look exceptional by any stretch, but he kept them in there, and they found a way to win. And, I mean, we as Flames fans know so much about that as well, because that's something that Mika did for us for so many games. I can't even count how many games the Flames played rotten, but ended up winning because Kipper gave him a great game. Exactly. And even Hiller and Ramo this year have done the same. Yeah, true. 
I think less less times this season than perhaps in other seasons, but yeah, it's definitely happened. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, two games, uh, the last two home games for a while, and we're going on the road. And like you said, um, hopefully we can have some more success against some of the Eastern Conference teams. Um, Treliving said in a press conference the other day that at the beginning of the season, when the team looked at this coming road trip, they said they wanted to be meaningful. So hopefully they can, you know, make something of this because it's going to be a very meaningful road trip. Yeah, exactly. It's a lot better than it, say, like fighting it with Edmonton and Buffalo for who can be the worst team in the league. At least, even though the Flames currently reside in ninth, they're at least in a position where if they do have a strong road trip that they can hopefully bounce back into a playoff spot and perhaps even home ice depending on how the next two weeks go yeah yeah we'll see right now the flames are sitting at ninth they're one point out of a playoff spot which is uh different than what we've seen the last couple weeks where we've always been talking about the flames in a wild card spot but one point out, I'm not too worried. But if they let this road trip get away on them, we might have some concern. Oh, yeah, exactly. If they start sliding, like it, with the Wild and Kings especially making such a strong push, it wouldn't take a lot for the Flames to tumble way out of the playoff spot. For sure it wouldn't. So let's let's hope that they do fairly well on this road trip. And, you know, if you if you look, I think the first guy to ever mention this for the Flames was Daryl Sutter in terms of breaking down the season in a seven-game series. Do you remember it before him? Yeah, uh, well, no, it was him. But uh, the first time that the Flames had that was back in 2004 uh, in the final 28 games of the schedule. Sutter broke that down into the 28 or into the seven-game segments and... And that's kind of been something that every coach has done since. Yeah, well, it makes sense. It helps to manage the full 82-game schedule because I don't think that in prior seasons that teams were as focused in the early months, like October, November. And like if they were well out of a playoff spot, eh, it's early. And now it, it, there's more emphasis on the a point earned in October is as important as one earned in April. Yeah. And I think it's definitely easy to look at seven games at a time instead of looking at 82 games all at once. Yeah. So I've actually gone ahead and broken down our whole season into seven game series. Cause I was curious how many series the flames have won. And if it was a playoff series, um, how many games it would have taken. So we'll post all this data on the show notes for this week at firesidechat.ca. So it's going to maybe be hard to follow this table um, by audio, but if you want to read it, you'll be able to go to firesidechat.ca, find episode 73, and I'll have the whole uh, the sheet of data to, to date there. But just going through this a little bit, um, the season started on October 8th, and we played our first seven-game series that ended on October 21st. In that series, it was a seven-game series. So if it was the playoffs, it would have taken seven games to get to the end. The Flames won that series four to three, um, which is you know a good way to get off to the start of the season is to get four four of your first seven wins. The next series started on October twenty-third and went to November sixth, and again that would we won that four to three. But if that was a playoff series, we would have been done in six games. Uh, does that make sense? Yeah, of course. So even though we even though we wanted four to three, it would have been a six game playoff series. Um, yeah, it just net, means that we lost game seven after we won the series. Pretty much, yeah. Uh, the next one was November eighth. The series started, and it would have ended November twenty second. We won that one five to two, and it would have been a five game series. So yeah, we won four, we lost one. That would have been the end of the series. But I kept tracking the stats through all seven games either way. November 25th to December 9th was the next series. We won that one 5-2 to two again, and that was another five-game playoff series. So up till December 9th, we were 4-4 four for four in terms of seven-game series, which really, if you think about it, no matter where your team is in the standings, whether you're expected to be first or last, winning you know four of four series 
almost right till Christmas is pretty impressive. Yeah, and they got off to such a good start at the beginning of the season, and that has a lot to do with it, and the focus on making it a playoff series to and making sure that they actually won those playoff series instead of coming out not Black. as intently. Yeah, exactly. Which then is different than how we've seen this team in the past couple of years, because, I mean, Jerome never got started really until... January, and it seemed like the whole team lied behind because of it as well. Exactly. You can't have your best player missing the first three months of the season. The next series that we played was the one where we all started to get concerned. This was December 11th to December 22nd. We played seven games in ten days. And in this series, if it was a playoff series, unfortunately, we would have been ejected in four games. We went one for six in this series. And that was the big losing streak that we went on, and everybody thought that that might be the end of the good flame season that we had. Yeah, and if the bounces would have went better in that eight-game streak where we lost all those games in a row, the Flames probably could have won three or four of those. Unfortunately, like the Anaheim game, the, the bounces just weren't going their way, and they suffered accordingly. Yeah, I mean, that was a long time ago, but going back through my notes, um, there was a lot of those games the Flames did play hard, and yeah, they just got bad bounces, you know, they got bad, took bad penalties, that sort of thing. Yeah, exactly. I don't think and we can call it, bad bounces for all eight of those games that we lost, but we can definitely do no. it for some of them. No, exactly. And, like, if you look at November, like, towards... Uh, like right before we went on that long losing streak, there were some games in a row that we had last minute comebacks, coming back from two goals down in the last minute, all that kind of thing. So in my mind, it kind of balanced out. Yeah, and and I think if you go back and look at the season, that's the one that we're all going to agree was the turning point. I think we've seen a different Flames team since that. I think before we were getting lucky. You know, like you said, we were coming back at the last minute. We were taking advantage of really tired teams. I think since that uh, six, that series where we went one and, one for si- one and six, um, we've really seen this team play a more complete game. Yeah, and we're starting to see this team actually command the game instead of responding. And, like, even in that Anaheim game, for the first 35 minutes, they were controlling the play and taking it to Anaheim. Where earlier in the season, they would have been basically running around trying to get the puck from Anaheim. Yeah. And we're still seeing some of that. I mean, the Minnesota game was, I think, a great example last week where, you know, the Flames were giving it to Minnesota every chance they got, but... Near the end, they managed to compose themselves and come back and finally start to get some offense going. Yeah, with a young team like Calgary's, it's never going to be a a linear process, and you're going to see different players come out of the woodworks and play really well. And in earlier months, that was Josh Juris. More recently, he's been not as good and other players have performed better. Like, uh, David Jones has been playing really well lately. It's a team effort. Exactly. So we finish up here. December 27th through January 10th was another seven-game series. We won that 4-3, to three, and if that was a playoff series, it would have gone all the way to seven. That gave us 5-1 on our series record. January 15th through the end of January... Uh, we did 5-2, and that would have been a five-game series. And the last series that we just finished up here is February 1st to February 16th. And the Flames went 5-2 and two on that one, and that would have been a six-game series. So that puts our total this season at 7-1. to one. And really, when I counted that, I had to count that again, because even though we've done well, it it seems almost too good to be true that we're 7-1 seven, seven and one right now in our series total. Yeah, and with all of that, the Flames still find themselves outside of a playoff spot. (laughs) Well, that's it, yeah. 
Yeah. And I think, you know, if you look at the, at some of these, there were times when we were... I didn't count overtime losses in these as different. I just counted as either a win or a loss. Um, so, you know, overtime wins, overtime losses, I didn't factor in any differently. Yeah, and it's good that they're being as successful in these seven-game series as they have been. It's just that they're going to need to get a little bit more out of themselves even though they've been this good up to this point. And, you know, if we look at these, I mean, there's only been one series, which was the one we lost. There was a four-game series. We've had a couple that would have been five-game series, but most of them are seven and six. So, you know, as is, I guess, traditional for what we've seen of the Flames going to the playoffs, it's taken them a lot of games to get the job done. Yeah. And and that's not surprising to me considering they're ninth. If this was Anaheim, and we were saying, you know, it's taking them seven games to clear up a regular season series of seven, then you might have some concern there. Yeah, well, in a, a case like that, that would be more the aberration that, oh, it took seven it games. It took so long. Yeah. yeah, because you would see more like five, six, and seven game mm-hmm. winning streaks instead of our best basically being a five and two segment. Yeah. So I just thought it was kind of interesting to actually look at that. I know we all talk about as Flames fans ever since Daryl Sutter brought it up, but I thought it was kind of an interesting thing to bring up and to actually talk about and say, you know, this is what's actually gone on. This is what our seasons actually look like so far. Yeah, and it's encouraging that the young players are being focused enough to actually get the four wins in the seven-game segments. Yeah, for sure. And, you know, if it doesn't work out at the end of the season where the Flames actually miss the playoffs, at least they're getting into the habit of being able to battle and win the seven-game segments, even though it might prove ultimately futile. You know, when I look at this season, to me, the biggest thing I want to take out of this is uh, a team that's learning. I really don't care if we make the playoffs. Yeah, it'd be fun. But I really don't care if we make the playoffs as long as next year we can sit down and say, hey, you know what? This team learned a ton. We have a bunch of young guys that learned how to be NHL players. That's what I would call a successful 2014-2015 campaign. Exactly. And they'll know that, okay, we were this good last year and we missed. Or we barely made it or whatever the end result is. Okay, how do we be better than that? And Yeah. You know, taking that next step. And that also is incumbent on the younger players like Goudreau, who hasn't played as much as he has this year in a long time, taking that next step in the conditioning and that so he doesn't start getting gassed around game 50 and all that kind of fun. And Yeah, and I think it's definitely easier to convince those players of that, that, hey, if you work just a little bit harder this summer, mm-hmm. look at where we could be. Yeah, and like you look at a player like Sam Bennett, who has been out since training camp, and he gained 10 pounds of muscle mass despite rehabbing his shoulder. Well, let's talk about Sam Bennett for a minute since you brought him up. Uh, The Flames made the decision this week to send Sam Bennett back to the OHL. He's going to go back to the Kingston Frontenacs and play uh, with them instead of coming right to the NHL roster. To me, I think this is a good good idea. Um, As much as we all know Sam Bennett is probably the future of this team and the guy that we all want to see in a Flames jersey, we have to remember this guy hasn't played hockey at all this year. And stepping into an NHL role at his age without playing hockey... I think is going to be a tough thing for him to do. Even stepping into an AHL role is going to be tough. So I think, as Trey Living said, he's going to play with his peers. He's still a young man. The OHL is full of other young men. I think it's a great place for him to go and tear up that league, and then we'll see him next year or maybe uh, you know late this year, depending on how the front knacks do in the playoffs. What do you think, Matt? Yeah, well, if you look at the, what happened when Sven Berchi got recalled a couple years ago, In the first five games that he played, he scored three goals, and he's hit the wall ever since then and has not looked as good as he should have been. Perhaps the Flames were worried about that possibly happening again if Bennett came in and tore the 
strip off of things right off the bat, and then in the off season, thinking that it's easy, comes in and struggles next year. It could happen, and you know the Flames have enough tools in the toolbox that they can ha- deploy somebody else on the roster instead and allow we, as much as we want to see him we don't need him right now exactly and it, you know i think everybody would have liked to have seen bennett play at least one game but realistically you can have somebody else like an emile poirier michael Furlan, sven berchi david wolf Grandland, like I can go on for a few minutes of different players that you could put in the NHL roster and they'd be perfectly fine. And allowing Bennett to go back and try to drive Kingston into a playoff spot is a good, valuable experience for him. And hopefully he comes in next year in July and in September hungry for to make the team. Yeah, I look at it a couple ways. I agree with you about all those players you think should make the team. And I think if we look at those guys, they've actually earned a spot. I mean, they've played great in Adirondack, especially guys like, you know, Poirier. um, And they actually deserve to be here. We haven't actually seen anything from Bennett this year. If we look at the year's worth of work to say, you know what? This kid deserves to be in Calgary. Um, We know what he's done in the past, that sort of thing. But he's coming off an injury. We don't know what he has or hasn't done this year, what he was or wasn't capable of. And I think following on what the organization has said about, you know, a spot has to be earned, he hasn't done anything to earn a spot. Yeah, and, you know, as a fan, I would have liked to have seen him, you know, just because, hey, oh, of course, you know, this is the best pick in the organization's history. And there'll be plenty of time to see him. But the responsible decision was to send him back to Kingston and just let him tear that league up for the last month and a half of the season. If you listen to some of Tre Living's interviews recently, too, like they did a press conference um, at the Dome about, oh, I don't know, the, the well, the day they announced they were going to get let him go, so I think maybe Thursday. It sounded almost like Bennett was... Starting, and I'm trying to think of a good way to put this because I don't know, I haven't been there, but just listening to it, it almost sounded like um, Sam Bennett almost felt a little bit entitled to be on this team. Um, It sounded like he thought that, you know, this was his right to play in Calgary this year. So I almost wonder if maybe they're sending him down partly to kind of humble him and say, you know what, you don't have a right. You're not going to make this team just because you're a, you know, a sixth or not even sixth, a fourth overall pick. Um, you know, you, you're not going to be given anything. You have to earn everything. Yeah, and realistically, the Flames have a bad experience recently with Sven Berchi, thinking that he was entitled to a spot and not doing the hard work. Well, even before Berchi, if you remember the highest pick they had, which was Dion Phaneuf, and we had issues with him right out of the gate too. Yeah, exactly. And, well, speaking of Phaneuf, like, he came in like gangbusters in his first year and declined after that and has sucked pretty much his entire career. Like, yeah. he's still a good defenseman, but he's not as good that he could have been if he put the work in. And I think the Flames are trying to avoid that kind of a situation because you look at the skill level of a Sam Bennett and... Like, in training camp, in the development camp, and uh, in Penticton, like he wasn't far off skill-wise from Gaudreau. And you want to see him emerge as a top-tier player, because he does have that skill set. And you don't want his head getting in the way of his abilities. Yeah, exactly. I, I don't want to see his head get bigger than... It should, and I think just from what I've heard from Trillivan, it almost sounds like maybe there's a bit of an ego issue there, which I can't confirm. I am not in the dressing room. I haven't heard anything. It wouldn't surprise me. A lot of these guys are, you know, the biggest name um, on their junior team and that sort of thing, and I wouldn't be surprised if that gets them after a while. Probably, you know, would get to all of us, and we'd start to believe some of it, but I think that could be part of the reason the Flames sent him back down as well. Yeah, and, like, I can't speak on that either, but, you know, if you've always been the guy, 
on your team right from like the age of eight up well of course you're gonna feel that you know you are that good so throw me in and i'll do what i do but that's not necessarily the best thing for the player or the person and you have to gauge that and have the maturity as an organization to say no pump the brakes kid and you got to do the work and not just because you're as skilled as you are to just get be given a spot and let it rip well i think if we we're in a different position this year if we were last in the league and we hadn't seen great play from everyone in Adirondack, yeah, I think they probably would have given them a couple games. But I think, you know, a big part of it too was there's other guys that have earned that spot, and they have to reward those guys first. Because if you say, oh, well, he was the, you know, he was the first-round draft pick last year, so he's getting a spot. But Poirier, you stay in Adirondack and do your thing there. You're setting a bad precedent. Yeah, exactly. Because then Bennett magically becomes a higher priority than the guys that are actually doing well. Exactly. And that that can create resentment and divides in the locker room and all that kind of fun BS that, you know, can derail a team. So they did the right thing. I think so too. I've heard a lot of people that think they didn't, but when I look at it objectively, not as a – a Flames fan, I guess, where I'm thinking I just want to see Bennett this year. But when I think of it as a, I guess, more of a Flames pundit and someone thinking about this strategically, I think it's definitely the right move. Yeah, it's hard to remove yourself as a fan from yourself as a hockey analyst. Exactly. And, you know, because as a fan, like, I wanted to see Bennett this past week. And, like, him taking on the Wild or the Ducks or whatever and see how it goes but objectively the flames did the right thing yeah they did let's talk about a couple other young players and some roster moves then unless there's anything else you want to talk about with bennett no i'm good so the flames made some roster moves today in anticipation of their long road swing um we saw bennett put on the ir do we have any idea of how long bennett's on or not bennett sorry uh bennett's off the ir Bennett's been activated and sent down to Kingston. Paul Byron has been put on the IR. Do we have any idea of how long he's going to be injured for? Well, in the Minnesota game, it appeared that he uh, injured his foot and has been in a walking cast ever since. So he might be only out for a week or two. He might be out for a month. It There's no real indication on who, what, and all that, so... According to the Flames game, they're saying he's he's got a lower body injury. He'll be out for two games. I find it hard to believe that he'll probably be back skating in two games. Yeah, I would expect him... Anytime you're in a walking cast, the, usually that means that you're out Couple for... Couple weeks. Yeah, at least. Yeah. And the other guy that's uh, probably not going to be joining the Flames, at least not right at the beginning on this trip, is Matt Stajan, who's been given leave uh, because his wife is about to have a baby. And we, I think we all know what happened to Matt Stajan and Katie, his wife, previously. Um, their baby didn't make it. So I'm happy to hear that they're having another one. Um, they, After what happened last time, it just you, you can tell that they, they're so passionate, those two of them together. And if you see them, I, I'm just, I guess I'm glad that they're finally getting a baby together. Yeah, I'm hoping that everything goes smoothly uh, this time this around time. and yeah. that there's no issues and everything goes perfectly for them. Uh, I couldn't imagine what it would be like to go through what they did this past year, so I'm wishing them all the best and that everything goes perfectly for them. Yeah, for sure. You could tell how devastated they were last time. Yeah, you don't want to see that happen ever again. No, especially and, not to the same couple in, you know, a, a year and a bit. Mm-hmm. And so I, I'm i sure I can speak for everybody in Flames Nation that best wishes to the Stagians over the next week or two and hope that everything goes smoothly. The entire Sea of Red is sending positive thoughts to the Stagians. And so to replace those two forwards, the Flames made some recalls today. Um, they brought 
uh, winger Michael Furland back to the roster, and Furland's played a couple games here already this year. And they brought up a player who we've yet to see in a Calgary Flames jersey this year. Emile Poirier finally got called up. I think we all knew it was just a matter of time. And Emile Poirier will be wearing number 57 for the team starting on this road trip. I know you and I have both really liked Poirier, you especially this year. Um, you, you knew that it was coming eventually, didn't you? Oh, yeah. You can't keep somebody down that's playing that good. And... Poirier, he was more offensively dynamic at the beginning of the season, but he's been more focused on his overall two-way game since then, and he's looking more like a complete threat offensively and defensively. So, of anybody in Adirondack, he was by far the most deserving of a recall. And I'm looking forward to see how he plays against the Rangers if he draws in, or whatever team he plays against. The player that I was actually shocked that he got recalled was Furland, because up until the last two games, he's actually been playing quite poorly for how he was at the beginning of the season. So I'm hoping that he gets an opportunity to play and hopefully bounce back at the NHL level. He has been good in the last two games against Oklahoma, though. Yeah, he definitely looked good in the last two games against Oklahoma, and I'm I'm wondering the same thing. I'm wondering if they're bringing him up, maybe trying to snap him out of a bit of a slump that he's in down there. Well, another thought with him is that perhaps they might be showcasing him in a trade. I don't know. It, I thought weird, about that too. Weird things like that. Any bizarre things within a week of the deadline, you begin to question maybe the team's looking at him. Who knows? Could be. Yeah, or maybe maybe a team's not looking at them. Maybe the Flames are looking at a young piece that they want to add to something. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Like it, say like you're going to trade a guy like Curtis Glenn Cross and you're looking at an ask for from another team and they want Ferlin thrown in to make that trade. You know, you probably would like to see him one last time at the NHL yeah. level to see if that's okay or do you yeah. go a different route exactly well and I think too if he's already on the NHL roster it's probably a bit easier to move him as well mm-hmm. um, I also found it a little bit odd that the Flames were essentially calling up two wingers to replace two centermen so again, maybe not necessarily trying to fill the depth they've lost, but it could be that yeah, they're trying to showcase a guy. Um, well, it just it, it seems weird they brought up two left wingers to replace two guys that are listed as centermen. Well, the thing is, is that the Flames are so deep in the center ranks that like they got Colborn, they're shifting him back to center, and yeah, you, you have guys like Boma. And Boma's Juris. been playing center. Yeah, so like you can, there's That's more true. than one option. So yeah, it's not necessarily indicative of anything. It's just the Flames have like eight centers, so why not shift the couple back? <laughs> Do you think we'll see both these players on this road trip? I would assume so. Yeah, you could always scratch a guy like Juris, like Byron, like Granlund, depending on who's playing well. I I would assume that you wouldn't just recall these guys just to play them on in the press box, especially with the important games for Adirondack this week. And yeah, well, I mean, if you, if you really look at it, so the flames start their road trip in uh, New York city, then they go to uh, New Jersey, then they go play in long Island. Then they're in Philadelphia. Like you're, you're in New York state. If you needed to call a guy off from Adirondack, it would be so easy to do so on this road trip. Exactly. And Even if you're, it's not like he's got to fly, you know, to Dallas or something. You could probably get him there in an hour, maybe two. So yeah, I can't see them calling up a guy just to have him on the road trip when you're right there. Exactly. And with the Flames playing three games and four nights in the next couple of days, then the Adirondacks next game, I do believe, is on Friday. So if necessary, they could recall. Poirier and Furland for to play in the three games and then send them back down if needed or Grandland or you know what I mean like there's flexibility 
Well, and if you look, we have two sets of back-to-backs within within a week. Like, within six games of each other, we have two sets of back-to-backs. And that's where I think you'll start to see some of these guys drawn into the lineup of wanting to change things up a little bit. Uh, you know, we see the Rangers and then the Devils back-to-back this week. And then next week, we see the Bruins and the Red Wings back-to-back. And I think that there's going to... There's going to be some guys that are maybe a bit worse for wear after the first game that it would make sense to put different guys in the lineup the second time around. Exactly. And having extra forwards never hurts, especially, like, say, like, uh, you get a repeat of the Anaheim game and, you know, you're giving up six goals, you'd probably want to bench the players that are playing the worst of that. Yeah, well, I think sometimes, too, you know, you're right there, but I think sometimes, too, it's probably also a matter of um, just being harder to scout. You know, if you're putting different guys in and out, it's hard for the video scouts to know exactly who's going to hit the ice. True. So, and, and it gives you, yeah, lots of different line combos. You can try a lot of different things. So I'm looking forward to seeing them both. I think that they're both going to probably play this week. I think in the three games this week, we'll see them both out, out on the ice. Yeah. Now, a question I have for you is, would you play Poirier at any point with Johnny Gaudreau and Sean Monaghan? I don't think I would say that there's no point in which i do that. I don't know that I would necessarily start the games that way. Um, I think that we've, we've got Monaghan especially on a line where he's looking really good right now. But perhaps that could be a good power play line. Perhaps, you know, later on in the game, if we're up by a by a bunch or down by a bunch and we want to change our lineups, I don't think it could hurt to maybe do it at that point. Yeah, I'm just looking forward to, like, a tester for not perhaps this season, but next year getting a look or two with the kids to see. Because Poirier, the, he is known for his speed. And mm-hmm. it, he's a bit of a bruising forward at times as well. He's not afraid to mix things up. So maybe that might be a good look for uh, to a player to play opposite Gaudreau. Not necessarily all the time, but something to look you know, forward to for next year. And I could also see the Flames putting him on a line with a guy like Glenn Cross and trying to say, okay, here's the kid, keep up to him. True. You know, maybe yeah, put him on like Glenn Cross and Granlin or something like that. Yeah, and especially Glenn Cross. He hasn't had a single point, I don't think, in 2015. I don't know if he had an assist in the Anaheim game. So, you know, it might help to spur him on if he's playing with somebody who's equally quick. Yeah, well, I mean, we've heard Yari Hoodler say that he almost feels like he's... Uh, you know, he's he's a much younger player this year um, because he's playing with the young guys. Maybe you could get the same kind of thing out of a Grandland or, you know, David Jones or somebody like that. Yeah, it, it gives the Flames flexibility, especially with a guy like Poirier because he can play the defensive third, fourth line role and the flashier top six role. Yeah. Well, well, that'll be a good story for us to chat about next week and see how he's been used on the road trip so far. Mm -hmm. And I guess the last piece of uh, news for the Flames' young players, this one's unfortunate, is uh, Yoni Ordeo is out for six to eight weeks. He got injured against the uh, Oklahoma City Barons in overtime. So that means that Doug Thyssen is going to be moving into the lineup there, and I imagine Doug Carr will probably be the backup, but... That's a long time. That's essentially the rest of the season. So, Ordeo is pretty much done for the rest of the year. Yeah. Yakimov for uh, Oklahoma, he crashed the net and yeah. didn't really get out of the way of Ordeo at all. It was quite intentional. I'm surprised it was only a two minute minor. Me too. And I wasn't, I was totally not going to be surprised if, you know, the next game they uh, put McGratton and Wolf out with his number in mind. Yeah, that didn't come to fruition, and uh, it, it's unfortunate that Ordeo went down. It probably means that if the Flames had any inclination to trade Kari Ramo, that that kind of goes out the window now. And perhaps the Flames start looking around the league at a 
potential depth goaltender as well, because Adirondack slid out of a playoff spot this past week, and they're, they, like the Flames, are in a dogfight right now, and relying on Brad Thiessen, who hasn't been exactly exceptional at any point this year, is not very good when you're in a stretch drive. Yeah. You know, the... The idea, well, I, so I'll start by saying I agree with you. That I think now that um, Ordeo's hurt, I think it definitely changes perhaps the way that the Flames are going to approach Kerry Ramo at the trade deadline. I think before this, you would definitely look at him and say, okay, we probably want to try and move Ramo since his contract's over at the end of the year. I think at this point, uh, you really have no choice. You have to keep Ramo around. But I agree with you that I'd look for another goalie. Um, and I'm even wondering who's out there. Guys like Josh Harding and Victor Foster, I think both still unemployed, aren't they? Yeah, and uh, like if you look at a team like, say, Chicago, uh, they just signed Scott Darling to a two-year extension. They already have Corey Crawford for a six-year deal. Maybe they you can pick off a guy like Antti Ranta, who's been quite good for Chicago in a backup role and bring him in, it probably wouldn't cost you a lot. You know, it's not like Red O'Bara last year where we managed to get a second-round pick. Goalies like that, like, you look at Jonas Enroth, he only required a third-round pick. So... See, right now I look at the Flames as needing, I mean, immediately an AHL starter. True. And my my worry about bringing in a guy like um, Ranta is is he still waiver eligible? Uh, he's in uh, Chicago's farm team right now. Okay. They sent him down. It's one of those things that it it would be like if you could find a suitor for Ramo while acquiring Ranta. I don't think you would bring a guy that good if you're planning on uh, putting him at or on no. deck. For sure. And and I agree with you. I think if they're going to move Ramo, they have to then mo- make a move to bring a goaltender back. Yeah, so like that's where that kind of a target would be. Otherwise, you could look around the AHL for like a guy like Joey McDonald, who plays yeah, in or, Hamilton. Somebody on that level. and you Or will- even some UFA who hasn't played all year. You know, someone like Victor Fosh. I don't even know where he's at now, but bring him in for the remainder of the year. Well, isn't Foss with Edmonton still? Is he? Yeah, I think so. I think he's hurt right now. Could be. Um, but yeah, I mean, there are even a guy like even there. an older guy like Josh Harding, who's playing in the AHL right now. Um, you know, I could see the Flames signing him. He's thirty to a one-year deal because he could possibly even be an NHL backup for the rest of the year if need be. Yeah, or you could see like an AHL trade, like. Uh, Last year, when the Flames dealt uh, Mark Kandari for Corey Locke, yeah, because I'm sure that, like, say, like uh, the Nashville's farm team, they have two uh, quality uh, goalies down there, and they might be willing to flip one to our team just for the stretch drive to allow both guys to get some starts in. Yeah, I mean, to me, the way I look at it is I don't want to give up much because I don't think that we need a goalie long-term. We need a short-term fix, and that's why I think bringing a guy like Josh Harding in might be a good idea who has NHL experience, could be in the AHL or an NHL backup this year, and if we sign him to a one-year, then we can reevaluate what to do at the end of the year, and I would say you probably don't bring him back because everyone will be healthy again. Yeah, exactly. And it, like everything, it depends on the price tag as well. Like, if you can get, say, a guy like Anti Ranta for, like, a fourth-round pick, sure, why not? If it's going to cost you a lot, then don't bother. So it, it's, it depends on what the cost is, really. Yeah. Because if you get a bargain, then, you know, you're not going to walk away from a potential starter for a fourth-round pick. Oh, of course not. And, you know, may, maybe there's even something to be done there. I mean, Rant is with Chicago. Um, one of the teams on Glenn Cross's list of team places can be traded is Chicago. Maybe there's a deal to be worked out there. Exactly. And uh, as good as Hiller's been for Calgary, he's not going to be a long-term starter for the Flames. So 
that's up in the air as well. So, you know, there's a lot of moving parts. And and to me, I would rather have almost, let's say, um, let's say that we do deal Ramo or we lose Ramo as a UFA, instead of just giving Ordeo the backup job, I would love to see a, uh, you know, a fight between like Ranty and Ordeo for Ranta and Ordeo for um, that backup spot, you know? Whoever wins stays in the NHL, whoever loses goes to the AHL. Exactly, and that would be a good competition with Hiller next year, who's going to be in Ramos' position this year. And if, say, Ranta wins the spot, then he might be able to take the starter's role away from Hiller next year. Who knows? This is all, you know, BS, but yeah, it... There's options, that's all. I've always thought that the more quality goaltending prospects of all positions, I think the more quality goaltending prospects you can get at any one time, the better your team's going to be long-term. It's easy to acquire forwards, not as easy to acquire defensemen, but there's still a lot more of them. But to me, the more quality defensemen you can have in a team at any one time in a system, the better you're going to be for the long term. Yeah, exactly. And like the Flames right now, they have Orteo, they have Jonathan Gillies, they have Mason McDonald, but they don't have anything else beyond those three. So and Even Gillies and McDonald are a couple years away. Exactly. And if you can acquire a guy who's closer to to the NHL and being a potential starter, it, the more of a logjam you have between the pipes, the better off you are. And yeah. you don't want an incumbent guy that, like, a, okay, Leland Irving, you're the guy because you're the only guy we have. <laughs> Curtis McElhaney, you're suiting up because you're the only guy in the organization. Yeah, so it... Like, even at the NHL draft this year, I wouldn't be opposed to the Flames acquiring yet another goaltender just because of that. Well, the other thing is goaltenders are great assets, too. Like, if you sell the right goalie at the right time, you can make a lot for that goalie on the trade market. Red O'Bara. <laughs> exactly. So, you know, the more goalies you have, even if we decide, you know what, we've decided that, you know, next year maybe we want to have Gillies in the AHL and... Ordeo in the NHL, and that makes Ranta odd man out. Flip him, and you'll get some for him. Yeah, there's plenty. The more flexibility you have, the better off you are long term. And, you know, you don't want to have a situation where you're relying on one guy or two guys. Exactly. We've talked a little bit about um, Ramo and, you know, the goaltending for the deadline, but why don't we talk about the biggest story, I think, that came out since the last time you and I talked, which was Curtis Glencross. Um, we've been talking all season about, you know, the, the fact we think he needs to move, and since the last time you and I talked, he's pretty much come out and said he wants to be traded, and he's submitted a list of teams to the Flames that he's willing to go to because he has a no-trade clause. And he's told, apparently, the Flames that he's willing to go to Tampa Bay, Chicago, Nashville, L.A., and Anaheim. Um, when I look at that list, I say there's no way we can trade him to L.A. or Anaheim. Nashville, maybe. Chicago, maybe. And maybe Tampa. But of that five teams, I see three that I'd be okay to trade him to. What do you think? Well, if Anaheim or L.A. wants him, they're going to have to overpay and well, that's it. I th- yeah, I think you can definitely send him there, but it's going to cost more to do so. Yeah, it's sort of like what uh, Vancouver, when they were trading Corey Schneider, they wanted uh, the seventh overall pick plus Edmonton's second rounder and instead settled for New Jersey's ninth round pick or ninth overall pick. So you can't, if you're going to be facing that guy repetitively, you don't want to walk away with a cheap asset and like if well, not even facing them but i mean going to somewhere like la where that could cost us a playoff spot exactly and with anaheim or la uh you're gonna want a guy like shay theodore or Devonte smith pelly or the la's equivalent to that and i can't seem want just... to give those up no and if you're say trading with Tampa Bay if they offer a second round pick you'd probably be fine with that yeah I'd be okay moving them to the east yeah or even the central division because 
in terms of the playoffs, that doesn't matter nearly as much. Yeah. No, that's true. I think the East would be ideal. Another division in the West would be next best, but I really don't want to trade him to... I mean, Anaheim, the only time I'd be worried about that is if we ended up facing them in the playoffs. That's assuming we're going to get to the playoffs. Uh, we see Anaheim once more this season, so it's not going to affect us much regular season. They're already a lock for the playoffs. The big team I wouldn't want to see him on is L.A. because I feel like if he were to get going after the deadline like Camilleri did last year, that could cost us the playoffs. Yeah. Um, yeah. L- L.A., it would require a lot, a lot, a lot. The for... price would be more than L.A. would want to pay for Curtis Glencross. I probably wouldn't trade him unless the first round pick was coming back our way. And <laughs> I don't see L.A. ever agreeing to that. No, me neither. And, you know, I, I, I don't know. I think it's funny that for a guy who has, what, eight weeks left on this contract, that he's so restrictive in his teams. Like, to me, I would almost be willing to go to any team that's pretty much locked in on the playoffs because it's not a long-term deal. And we discussed this a bit last week. You know, I think it's, I don't want to say selfish, but, you know, it's not like you're going to be here for two, three years. You're there for six weeks. So I, I wish you would have given us a much more expanded list, but that's the way it works with no trade clauses. Yeah, well, if you look at a team like Montreal or the New York Rangers, who are both solidly in the playoffs, and, well, the Rangers made the Stanley Cup Finals last year, you would think that those teams who probably both would like Glenn Cross on their team would be suitable destinations, but there's still a week left. It, you know, if the Flames... Come to Curtis Glencross and say, okay, we've got a deal in place with the New York Rangers. They're not on your list. Would you mind waving? He probably would say yes just because of that. But Yeah, or or they might even come back to him, you know, in a few days and say, we can't make a deal with any of these five. Give us three more. Exactly. There's still a week left, and unfortunately, we won't know exactly the details until... You know, two minutes after the trade deadline, so... Yeah. Do you think it's going to go right down to the deadline for moving Glenn Cross? Ideally, uh, if you're wanting to get him a trade involving him, I would prefer it done today than all the way to whatever the exact moment of the deadline. But if it takes till then, uh, so be it. I'm kind of surprised that he's still a flame. Like for a guy who announced his intention to want to be traded last week, I'm kind of surprised that they haven't moved him already. Yeah, so was I. I was actually somewhat surprised that the Flames didn't sit him down against Anaheim and just let one of the other players play just for the fear of having him get injured like Zabenik Mihailik did for Arizona. Yeah, well, and I mean, there's two ways to look at that, right? If if you think that Glenn Cross is the best guy to get you a win right now, you got to play him. But I agree with you. I don't want him to play on this road trip. I'd probably leave him at home on the road trip if I was the GM. I'd say, you don't want to be on this team. You know, you've asked to be traded. That's fine. Let me work a deal. You stay in Calgary. Yeah, uh, it's a double-edged sword, too, because you don't want to piss off other players and all that as well. So... No, but I mean, he asked to be traded, and to me, that means that you treat him a bit differently. If it was just, you know what, I'm trying to work a deal for you, I wouldn't say stay home. But if he apparently asked to be traded, I didn't hear it myself, but everyone's reporting he asked the Flames to be traded. So at that point, I think you say, okay, I'm going to help you out with this, but you got to help me out. you got to stay here and stay healthy, so i got to keep you off the ice. Yeah, uh, I agree. I I wish that this would get resolved by the time that the Flames play tomorrow, but... Uh, generally, if you look when a guy has to be traded, especially this time of year, they're generally gone within, you know, 24 to 36 hours, it seems. And I was refreshing the TSN site all weekend going, you know, this has got to be finished by Monday. Yeah. Well, we'll see. Uh, you know, with our luck, we'll probably hear about it first thing tomorrow morning or something like that. Yeah, yeah, and you know we're going to the east now. Maybe there's some buyers in the east who want to see him up close. Um, you know, send some scouts out to the New York area. Yeah, well, the Flames did apparently have four scouts in the New Jersey game this evening, so 
Who knows? Maybe there that's just advanced scouting for the I have game a friend on probably Wednesday. got scouts all over the league all year long. True. I would if I was a GM. I mean, you've got pro scouts. That would be, to me, their job is to go watch pro games. I think we probably talk about it more this time of year, but I imagine they're always out there. Yeah. What do you think the chance is that Curtis Glencross is still aflame come the 3rd of March, the day after the trade deadline? I would be somewhat shocked and not so much disappointed. It would be surprising unless the Flames have him signed to a contract beyond this year. Yeah, you know, like if they decide that eh, we want to keep you long term, I wouldn't be a fan of that personally because I think we have too many good young players. But well, and for a guy who's asked for a trade, do you think you could really go and sign him to a long term deal after that? No, it... I want out. Just kidding. Yeah, it. I would be somewhat annoyed if he was here on the third sort of like how you and I were last year when Camilleri was still on the team yeah I think Glencrest took a hometown discount last contract to stay here in Calgary I can understand him rightfully wanting to go to the UFA market and seeing what's out there and maybe not saying he won't come back next year but you know seeing what other offers are out there and let the Flames still make their pitch in July but I can't see him now going and signing a long-term deal after he's asked to leave Exactly, and I... It's like you telling your boss, I hate working here, and the next day going, I need this job, please keep me here. Yeah, uh, I don't blame him whatsoever for wanting money. Like, give me a break. You know, I was shocked that he signed the contract that he did. But... (sighs) And I think he's earned the right at this point to go to unrestricted free agency, and I think it's a great time in the Flames' development to lose him. I think we can afford at this point with the way he's playing and the way we're seeing young players emerge to let him go there and not see a huge dent on this team like we might have a year or two years ago. Exactly. And, yeah, it's just frustrating, the whole situation, because you like the player, but... We can't get too attached to these guys, though. I mean, they're business assets. And in the NHL today, you're lucky to stay on a team, it seems, for three, four years. I know. Uh, that's the hard part, separating yourself as a fan from of the player and the business side of it where it is a numbers game and uh, unfortunately Glenn Cross is pretty much right at the bottom because of his contract expiring first. Yeah. You know, like if you had a guy like, say, if Jones or Stajan or several of the other players if their contracts were expiring at the end of this season i think you would keep glenn cross over them but yeah that's not how it's shaking out this time around and and i think part of the reason we all like glenn cross so much is we know him better than all these guys he's been here longer than most guys in this team i think he's been here longer than everyone but giordano yeah i think so so you know it's like we like geo you know i think we've got to know these guys intimately because they've been here for so long just as we will with you know guys like Johnny Goudreau and you know hopefully Josh Juris Marcus Granlund the longer they're here the longer and better we get to know them yeah and the harder it is to see them moved exactly because uh, uh, I know a lot of people like Curtis Glencross as a person it's just unfortunately it's a numbers game and there's just simply not enough room we're not trying to acquire the nicest roster here of nice guys. We're trying to, you know, put together a competitive hockey team. And just because he leaves doesn't mean he won't come back. I don't think they're burning a bridge necessarily like they did with Jerome. There's no reason we couldn't throw him an offer July 1st and say, hey, this is not as good as everyone else gives you. But if you want to come back, here's our offer. Yeah, and I could see that. Like a one-year $4 million or something like that if they exactly. felt that it was warranted. And I think, you know, when he goes to another organization, he might realize what he's missing here. Like, you know, he loves this area. He loves the Chucks, that sort of thing. Maybe he goes to Tampa Bay and he says, you know what? They don't treat me as well as Calgary does or something like that. I'm willing to to come for less. Uh, uh, you don't know until you get there. So what what kind of return do you think we'll see for Glenn Cross at the deadline or before the deadline? Ideally... I would prefer the Flames getting, at minimum, a second-round pick. 
I think anything less than that, they've sold a little low, just because of the fact that Glenn Cross is pretty much the top winger that's available. Uh, if they get a, a borderline first or equivalent prospect, that's a home run. If they get only like a third or a fourth round pick, that's a little bit of a disappointment. Yeah, I think the fair market value for Glenn Cross is a second round pick. Yeah, and if you get a second and a third equivalent prospect, then, you know, that's good too. It just depends on who's offering what and how much. It, you never know. Like, Paul Gostad went for a first round pick a few years ago. You might see something like that if a team really wants Glenn Cross badly enough and are planning on signing him to a long term deal. Who knows? Well, and that's the thing is Glenn Cross hasn't had a great season. It's not like we're trading him from a position of power here where you need this guy for your playoff run. And as such, I think that in order to move Glenn Cross for a price that we think is fair, we might see him packaged with a younger player and shipped out of here as part of a package deal. I wouldn't be surprised to see someone like Furland or Reinhardt be shipped along with him. Yeah, I could see that. Uh, especially like if the Flames are acquiring a prospect over a draft pick. Like If they're getting just a draft pick, I don't see the need to include the secondary prospect. But like no, if you're but maybe you do like a Glenn Cross and Furland for a third round pick and a prospect. Yeah, like if say like with Anaheim, because I mentioned Shea Theodore, like okay, we'll give you Furland and Glenn Cross for Theodore. It's a slightly better return than you would anticipate, but in order to make the deal work you have to include one of the forward prospects. Yeah. Or, you know, going back to what we talked about earlier, I could see doing something now that we, you know, need a goaltender. Maybe you're right. Maybe we do something like, um, you know, Glenn Cross and Reinhardt for Ranta. Well, I think you'd want a little more than Ranta, perhaps one of their defensive prospects, because they do have Yeah, quite but a I mean, as, as... I don't know if i take a defensive prospect. I might take a lower round pick, but yeah, I, I think that might be the keys to the deal, though. It might be kind of Glenn Cross and Reinhardt for Ranta and something tossed in there. True. Uh, um, in, you know, I think that would be the big key to it. Going back to the goalie side for a minute, if Anaheim didn't beat us to it, I was almost ready to say coming into this week, you know what I'd do? I'd sign Breeze Galov for the rest of the season and trade Ramo. Well, uh, yeah. But Breeze Galov has been absolutely horrendously bad for Anaheim this year. And he got waived and nobody claimed him. So, Do you think that's just something about the goalie market at the deadline as well? No, I think that's more of a reflection that Breezegloff has been terrible this year. <laughs> and, yeah. yeah, it's... you If you can't rely on the goaltender to be even adequate, there's no need to acquire him. And Breezegloff has been terrible for Anaheim. I just, I just thought bringing him in, waving him, sending him to the A to fill in for Ordeo. Yeah, I wouldn't even bother then, because like his goals against average is over four. So yeah, oh, really, I didn't know it was that yeah, bad. Yeah, it's that bad. <laughs> so I think Thiessen would actually be an upgrade. So going back to the trade deadline, then I think we can both agree what the Flames need to be looking for if they are going to add. If there's one thing, is depth on the blue. Yeah, if they're going to add, I would like them to get. Not just a like a number five, but I'd prefer them to go all in and get a number three that's good and will be good for the long term. Uh, it's just unfortunately uh, we're kind of in line with probably a dozen teams <laughs> at the moment. So, uh, yeah, defensemen are kind of difficult to acquire at the moment. Well, and I think we're in a really weird spot going into this deadline, a spot that not a lot of teams are in and we haven't been in a lot either. And that's that we don't want to be buyers or sellers. You know, at the beginning of the season, we probably thought the, as we all did, the flames were not going to have a good season. They'd probably go to the deadline, sell off whatever assets they had and just be part of the, you know, McDavid Eichel sweepstake. Now we might be pushing for a playoff spot, but I don't want to give up a lot because we're still in the middle of a rebuild. So we're in this really weird spot of not really wanting to give up any assets 
But needing some assets, we're going to go forward with a playoff. Yeah, spot. we're in the bargain bin sweepstakes. Yeah, if you can exactly. find somebody that can perform without giving up anything, that would be great. I don't know if those players exist at the moment, but... Yeah, uh, well, and, and if they do exist, I don't know if we would want to pay whatever it's going to cost to bring them yeah. in. Like, I, honestly, I don't think that... Unless it was a top tier player, I don't see the Flames giving anything more than a fifth round pick for any acquisition, if that, or an equivalent prospect like a Henowski or Agostino or whatever. No. I don't see the need. No, it's I don't just either. if it's different if you can find a good quality number three. And, like, you'd be wanting to acquire that guy at the draft or next year at the deadline or whenever anyway. So, it just depends on who, what, where, and all that fun stuff. Yeah. So, The last thought I'll put out there for the uh, trade deadline stuff, and I've said this earlier in the year, I don't think that we're going to see, come the end of the deadline, all of our prospects still here. I, I believe that the Flames are dealing from a position of power with their prospects right now. And I think that we're going to see the Flames starting to take stock of what they have and what they don't have and saying, you know what, maybe we can afford to move a guy like a Reinhardt or Hanowski or somebody like that and, you know, get a draft pick or another young prospect. I just think that we're, we have such prospect depth right now, the Flames will probably move somebody. Yeah, like I could see a Corbin Knight-style trade perhaps – acquiring a defense a defenseman instead like uh say like from buffalo because they have a whole bunch of defensemen maybe snagging one of their depth guys who knows i could also see them doing almost the reverse of like a joel colborne deal too and saying here's a guy who, part who potentially has some potential he's not going to make it in our organization but maybe he'll make it in your organization. Same thing we did with Russell and Colborne, and maybe you know deal someone like a Reinhardt to Toronto and say, hey, you guys are looking for some young talent? Here's a young guy. Uh, Toronto's not going to want to give up a draft pick, but somebody like that. You know, here's a young guy. Give us a fifth. Yeah, like if you can get like a fifth, sixth, or seventh for, depending on the guy, of course, for whatever, then I don't see a the harm in that especially when you look forward to next year the flames will have a few forwards that are going to be needing spots as well yeah because like hunter smith is eligible for the a uh the guy they drafted in the seventh i can't remember his name off the top of my head he's is ready Olus Matson? no uh the forward guy carol oh. there you go oh austin carol yeah yeah he's available for the ahl Plus, you've got guys like Jankowski who might get signed. There's a whole bunch of options, so it's not like at Stockton is going to be depleted if the Flames were to trade two or three guys off for draft picks. And even if they don't trade them directly for a draft pick, again, I could see tossing them in with Glenn Cross and getting a pick back. Exactly. Tossing them in with Ramo getting a pick back. I just think that we're going to see... I think a lot of people are going to be surprised by it, but I think we're going to see one of the guys who hasn't had a lot of time this year, be it Reinhardt, Furland. I don't think it's going to be Granlund or Juris or anyone like that, but someone like Reinhardt or Furland, who's going to move because the price was right. And we have so many players that we can afford to. Exactly. And it depends. Like You might even see a guy like Juris or Granlund get dealt if it makes sense. Because <laughs> if, yeah. you know, if you're getting a top-tier guy... Uh, you well, might. then anything's on the table, but I wouldn't be surprised if the Flames were out shopping some of the prospects and not those two. No, and that's all the fun and speculation over the next couple, like, eight days or whatever till the deadline. So, it'll be fun. <laughs> the last question I wanted to ask you and have some discussion around for the deadline is, do you think they'll finally do what we've been talking about, especially me talking about for over a year now of playing banker, and taking back a bad contract from somebody in exchange for, you know, a top prospect or a pick or something like that? Well, the player that I would like is uh, from Chicago is Brian Bickle. Like, he is a $4 million contract, but if you can get a solid prospect in addition to that, 
it would help solve a lot of Chicago's cap problems at the moment, and they do have some good prospects and draft picks, so it's possible that they could do that. And I don't think Bickle's all that bad of a player either. Like, it's a bad no. deal, but I think that he could be very productive here. Exactly. He's a third-line, fourth-line guy. Uh, he could be the next Curtis Glenn cross for this team. Uh, yeah. Uh, in terms of roster position and that sort of thing. And the Flames do need quality depth still. Uh, it's not like we are going to trade off Stajan, Jones, this, that, exactly. the next thing. And we need replace veteran them. leadership. Yeah, and... Bickles won a cup. I think mm-hmm. he won two. I'm not sure if he was on the first roster or not. But he's been a good player, and especially in the playoffs, he does elevate his game. So perhaps that might make sense for the Flames, especially with the cap going down. I was going to say, with the cap going down, I think it's almost inevitable that the Flames are going to have to take a contract from somebody whether it's the deadline, I'm not sure, or if it might happen in the draft. But I think between those two days, it's inevitable. I think the Flames are going to take somebody's bad contract. And that's a good thing. Uh, especially it can if, be a good thing. Especially if we... you're getting uh, something good to go with it. Like, well, that's it. You're not going to take a crappy contract because even we're going to want to you know, go to our cap in a couple of years. So we're not going to take a crappy contract and not get much back for it, like a fifth or a sixth round pick. Well, like the Flames apparently were asking for Tyler Toffoli to take Mike Richards. So, wow. you know, if it, that was the case, then sure, you eat yeah. Mike Richards' contract. Who gives exactly. a shit? <laughs> but, and, you know, again, maybe there's a big deal. I, I can't see the Flames doing a lot of deals on deadline day, but I can see them maybe doing one big deal and being settled on it. Maybe it's Glenn Cross and Reinhardt go somewhere for a bad contract and a first round pick. And that would make sense. It just it depends on what's out there and does yeah. it actually make sense. Exactly. We've seen a lot of years where the Flames have made a couple minor trades. We've seen some years where they've been very active. Uh, we've seen some years where they've made big moves. I think this year, if they make a move, it's probably going to be one, maybe two deals that are going to happen. And I wouldn't be surprised if we do one deal, unload everything we need to unload at one at one point in time, and we're done for the day. Well, actually, I'm kind of thinking the opposite. I think they might actually go nuts and make three or four trades with players coming in and departing at the same time. Like, both playing the buyer and the seller. Interesting. Like, say, like, what we were discussing earlier, like, selling Ramo and acquiring Ranta, that kind of thing. Like, where you're shifting things in and out at the same time. Not necessarily in the same deal, though. Yeah, but I I could see that all happening. Yeah, one, maybe two deals and get all that done. Mm -hmm. Like, I see maybe there's a deal, say, Glenn Cross goes out, Ranta comes in, now we've got the goalie taken care of. Then, you know, Ramo and... Uh, Furlan go out and a draft pick comes in, we're done. True. But I can't see them making, you know, a couple deals with AHL players and maybe another deal with Jones. And like, I think three deals is the maximum I can see happening unless we're doing a big three way deal or bringing someone in and send them out the same day. Uh, it'll be fun. <laughs> It better because right now we've you know we've heard nothing. So I'm almost thinking that with nothing talked about and we're a week from the deadline, everything's gonna hit like an anvil last minute. Is my thought. Yeah, I could see forty or fifty trades, or something ridiculous, just because there has been absolutely no conversation in the media whatsoever. Yeah, and I mean, if you remember last year, all the deals happened at right at the last minute, like everything. The trade breakers on TSN, I remember watching them. They had nothing to talk about all day. And then after the deadline was done, everything you know was finalized and trade calls were done, and that's where all the activity happened. So I wouldn't be surprised to see the same thing happen here. Mm-hmm. But, yeah, I'm, I'm thinking the Flames are going to do something. I think they have to do something. Um, I'm not expecting much, but I'm expecting a few deals with a larger impact. We'll see. I'm just hoping that they don't get ripped off on any trade. That's my only hope for the next week. Well, <laughs> and, I, and I don't see how they would get ripped off. I mean, they don't need to make any deals. If we decide that, you know, we don't want to move Glenn Cross, it's not as though we absolutely must move him. 
I mean, if worst comes to worst and he's, uh, you know, he doesn't want to play here, bench him for the rest of the year. But I don't, I don't think that we're in a position where we have to make a deal and we might get hosed because of it. True enough. You know, last year I thought we got ripped off by not moving Camilleri because I would have been happy to have something for Camilleri as opposed to nothing for Camilleri. Um, but I think that even if we sit the way we are now, we're, I mean, we have so many assets coming up through the system that even if we can't move the ones that we need to move, we're still in a positive position for this year. True. And especially with having, I think, all of our draft picks this year, we have seven players that we're going to be adding to the organization on top of all of our depth as it is. Yeah, so, you know, I mean, if you would have told me last year Josh Juris would have played as important role as he would, I wouldn't have believed you. So I think even if, say, we don't move a guy like Glenn Cross, we have enough pieces that we can build on that we say, okay, we didn't move him, but look, we've got two or three guys that are ready to step into that spot anyways. We've got tons of money come July 1st. Yep, and we have flexibility where everybody else doesn't really, so... And that's where I think the Flames might make a deal last minute. I think it might come down to, crap, I've over-acquired today. Some other GM saying, I've over-acquired, I'm over the cap. Let's phone for a living and get him to help me out here. Exactly. And especially with the fact that the Flames have said repeatedly that they're willing to spend to the cap, that would allow for the acquisitions of players that you might not otherwise do Exactly. They might not be long-term building pieces for this team, but they might be that we're bringing them in just because the asset that comes with them. Exactly. Like If you look at uh, Carolina with Alex Seaman, if he was to come along with a guy like Victor Rask or their first-round pick or, you know, insert yeah. appropriate assets, then you look at it even though you w- wouldn't want that player playing for your team for the entire duration and i think you might also see that the flames might play banker on a smaller scale we might not bring over the big five six seven million dollar deal but maybe somebody's a million and a half over and we take a bottom nine forward from them and a marginal prospect to go with it or you know something like that where it might be a player like a brandon bowling type who you know they're a bottom nine guy but they can contribute and maybe they're gonna be a guy we keep for, you know, bottom nine here, but they're making 700000 more than they should. The Derek England-style contract, more or less. Could be. I, that's actually one player that I'd be very happy but surprised if we see is not here at the deadline. If we can find someone who wants to take England off our hands for, I'd say, almost any price, I'd do it. Eh, you need players still to play, and the Flames don't really have any defensemen Really. But I think it could let us try out Watherspoon for the rest of the year and then make a decision July 1st. Yeah. Well, England was partially brought in for his presence in the dro- the locker room, so who knows? Uh, yeah, he was, he, was also partly, he was also partly brought in for his goon qualities too, which we're seeing going downhill in the NHL. Yeah, that's something that wouldn't really be needed to be addressed till next year anyway, so... That's true. So, yeah, it'll be interesting. And when you and I talk next uh, next Tuesday night, hopefully we're going to see some Flames moves. Because even though I don't think they need to make many moves, it's always fun to see an active trade deadline for the Flames. Oh, yeah. That's part of the fun of the trade deadline is who's your pl- team going to trade off or acquire or what are they going to do? So. So let's hope that our trade deadline special has more to talk about than this pre-trade deadline special. Well, who knows? Maybe this time next week, Ginla and Tangay are back in Flames jerseys. <laughs> you know, I actually saw, I was looking on Reddit today, and there's some people that did a fantasy um, Flames trade deadline on their Xbox or something. And one of the trades they actually made was sending Jones, and I think, um, jo- I want to say Jones and Furland to... Um, Colorado and bringing Iggy and somebody else back. Yeah. Not what I would do, but yeah, who knows? Yeah, who knows? The only way I could see them doing it is if Iggy says this is last year and you get him cheap just to let him finish out the year with the team. 
Well, he did sign for three years, so I don't oh, see him yeah, letting no, that's true. see him giving up fourteen million dollars. No, yeah, I forgot that he was on a multi-year. I thought he was on a one-year for some reason. Yeah, fun times. Well, Matt, anything else you want to talk about for this week? No, I'm good. Uh, just uh, predictions for next week. I uh, I think the Flames will get four points out of so the. We, we've got six on the table. Started the long road trip, and it's our New York swing. Yeah, I think we'll win the back-to-back and then lose to the Islanders. Do you think we'll beat both the Rangers tomorrow night and the uh, New Jersey Devils on Wednesday? Yes. Okay, so you're down for four for this week. Um, We both lost last week. I thought we were going to get no points last week, and you thought we were going to get two, and the Flames ended up with one. So we have no winner from last week. Um, I'm going to... I don't think we can win both back-to-back games. I'm going to go with two points for this week. I think the Flames will struggle against the the Devils, but I think they can beat the Rangers. Oh, okay. yeah. We, we aren't seeing two hot goalies right now, and that's my worry. We're seeing two sort of warm goalies, and I don't think that we can put them both in in the back-to-back and get great efforts from both of them. I think one of them will give us fantastic effort, not the other one. That's my rationale. Oh, okay. Well, So we'll see. We'll see next week, and... We'll have a lot to talk about, I hope. We um, will. That's the first three of a seven-game road trip. And uh, next Monday, the second, is trade deadline day. So enjoy this week. Enjoy the calm before the storm because every morning I wake up and I check TSN, I think, come on, there's got to be, like, I'm expecting to wake up one morning and just have a flurry of activity. It seems like the floodgates just have to break open pretty quick here. Well, usually there's something before the deadline. Usually about a week before, there's some big kind of blockbuster move that they wanted to get done ahead of time. Mm-hmm. Sort of like the Evander Kane trade. Yeah. And, you know, I, yeah, I'm just waiting for something else to happen here. Well, I hope everybody has an excellent week, and thank you for listening. And enjoy all the trade deadline coverage. Take care, everybody. We'll see you next week. Fireside Chat is edited by Mike Crosby and Brett Bauer. This show is licensed under Creative Commons license. For full license information, visit firesidechat.ca.